Welcome. Uh, we're starting today with part of lesson one, which is specifically chapter three in your biology textbook. So this webinar is going to cover all of the sections in chapter three. There's going to be review questions in this session, and they are just here for practice. They're not going to be graded. There are um, poll questions for you to answer, and those are just um, for you to participate, just to kind of get your brain going. We need you to participate in all of them. Uh, but nobody can actually see your individual answers, not even me. We just see the group's results. So don't hesitate to click which one you think is the right answer as we review. And then at any time that you have questions, um, you just type them in the question section of your GoToWebinar. And if you are watching this uh, recording later, um, you'll definitely want to check out our webinar schedule to see if there are any more live webinars for this class. So chapter three is about bio, um, well the whole thing is about biology, chapter three is about ecology. Ecology is the study of the way that organisms interact with their environment. This includes interacting with other organisms and with the non-living environment. So other organisms such as plants, animals, bacteria, etc., um, these are called biotic factors, okay, any living things. Any part of the environment that's not alive is an abiotic, abiotic factor, and here are some examples. So water, sunlight, snow, rocks, um, factors like the temperature and the humidity, the levels of oxygen in the air, all of those things are abiotic. They're part of the environment, but they're not living things. So your book has a great picture that illustrates the difference between these two. And on the right, it shows part of a picture that only shows the abiotic factors. There's nothing living, but it shows soil, water, sunlight, rain, and rocks. All the way on the left side of the picture, it shows only biotic factors. There's birds, trees, fish, and grass, but it leaves out the water and the soil and the sky. The part in the middle shows the biotic and abiotic factors together, both the living and the non-living things in the ecosystem, and it's a much more complete picture. So ecology is all about interaction, and we can study the interaction on different levels of organization. Okay, so one individual is called an organism. A single organism doesn't actually show any interaction, but a population is all of the individuals of the same species living in an area. So this could be a herd of elephants, as shown here. Um, or in that area, there would be acacia trees. All of the acacia trees living in the savanna would be a population, okay, or any other species. Um, it's just one species and all the members of it in that area. And looking at how all the living things interact with each other um, means looking at the biological community. So community is the interaction between all of the different species. So in this picture just shows elephants and grass and trees and zebras, but um, there would be a lot more going on. Um, there's all kinds of insects, there's lions, there's different kinds of plants, um, bacteria that you know are too small to put in a picture. All of that stuff is part of the community. And finally, all the ways that the community can interact with non-living things makes up the ecosystem. So I've added water and mountains into this picture, rocks, um, all of that is the ecosystem. All the abiotic factors that we discussed before, plus the community of all the living things, becomes the ecosystem. And then the term biosphere. Biosphere is the term for um, all of the places where life can live and all of the living things on Earth. The land, the water, the atmosphere are all of the biosphere. And all of these interact with living things. Okay, for example, um, plants make oxygen for the whole world. Even where there are not plants, there is oxygen to breathe in the atmosphere. 
There aren't any plants in Antarctica in the winter, but emperor penguins still have plenty of oxygen to breathe. Ocean currents affect the temperatures of entire continents, affecting what type of organisms can live there. And land formations, such as mountains, affect the weather, making different habitats for different living things. How do scientists study ecology? There's three different basic methods. By observation, they observe the presence of living organisms, changes in their populations, changes in behaviors, and changes in the ecosystem. This scientist here is making observations about a marsh. By experimentation, so ecologists can set up controlled experiments with small populations to see the effects of different variables. For example, an experiment might be to see if salamanders search for food less when there are fish in their environment than if they're in an environment without fish. And the third method is by modeling. So modeling means putting together existing data to represent a bigger picture, and that bigger picture is used to make conclusions, predictions, and hypotheses about the system. The models in this picture simplifies a stream ecosystem so that scientists consider all of the uh, different parts of it and what, how one part would affect another. So that's great for scientists, but you might think, why should I care about ecology? What does it matter to me? Well, we need resources to live. We need food, which is farmed from an ecosystem. We need drinkable water. We need fuel for heat and for other energies, such as transportation. We need resources for products, the raw materials for everything that we use and have comes from the environment. And we need clean air. Uh, that's you know, acceptable for us to breathe. So all of this requires that we maintain the ecosystems around us in a state that continues providing for our needs. So before we go on, let's do some review questions from this section. Um, so the first couple are polls for you to answer. So let me just bring up the first poll. Now remember, um, these don't count for a grade. These are just practice, and we just need you to participate to keep your brain working. OK, so our first poll is, which of the following is an abiotic factor? Trees, bacteria, rain, or fish? So we need to get an answer for that before we can move on. Okay, so I see we got some answers. So 100% um, of people answered rain, so that's great. So trees are living things, bacteria are living things, fish are living things. The only one that's not is rain, so rain is the abiotic factor. All right, let's see what the next one is. Okay, of uh, these, which of the following are biotic factors? You can choose more than one answer here. So mushroom, pack of wolves, sunshine, oxygen. How many of those are biotic factors?
Okay, and again, we need to get some answers before we can move on. Okay, so I see that 50% of you have answered. I guess that'll be enough. Okay, so for that one, which are biotic factors, well, that one had two right answers. Mushrooms, those are living things. Those are biotic. Wolves would be biotic. Sunshine and oxygen are part of the ecosystem, but they're not biotic factors. Okay, if the next three aren't poles, um, we'll just... Think about our answers and go over it. So the science that studies all of the interaction between living and non-living parts of an ecosystem is called what? So of our answers, forensics, ecology, chemistry, and metrics, the only one that deals with living and non-living parts of an ecosystem would be ecology. And uh, these next two are also not polls. Um, just think about what you think is the right answer based on what we just talked about. Are these correctly defined? So a population is all of the individuals of the same species living in one area, such as all of the white pine trees living in a forest. Okay, so um, if we think about that one, we go back to population. Our example was uh, when we were talking about the elephants on the savanna, the whole herd of elephants is the population. So same thing here, all of the white pine trees in a forest, it's all the individuals living in an area. So population is correct. Um, community, all of the different species that live in an area, including all of the plants, animals, fungi, and one single-celled organisms. Um, so that is also correct. Okay, and then we've got two more definitions. How about an ecosystem? All of the non-living things in an area, such as rocks, water, and air, but does not include living things. And a biosphere is an ecosystem in the ocean. Okay, so hopefully you're noticing some of this doesn't sound right. Um, so let's see what we can do to fix these. So an ecosystem is all of the non-living things in an area and all of the living things. So an ecosystem is made of all the organisms in an area and their non-living environment, all of that together. And then biosphere, if you remember, um, a biosphere is, is the living part of the Earth. So that's where the sphere part comes in. It's the entire globe. Okay, so not just in the ocean. A biosphere is all of the life on Earth and all of the parts on Earth where life exists. Okay, so I hope you did well on those, even though they weren't polls. And we're going to move on to lesson um, 3.2. Um, we're going to talk about the flow of energy in the ecosystem. So all energy on Earth starts with the sun. And there's a little asterisk there because um, that's to remind us that there is one exception to this rule, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But in general, energy on Earth starts with the sun. So what happens? Plants take the sun's energy and they go through photosynthesis and store it in chemicals inside the plant. And animals and bacteria and fungus eat the plants and they gain the energy from them. Then those animals, bacteria, and fungi might be eaten by other animals or bacteria and fungi which gain energy from them. And we could also use that energy in other ways like burning wood, fossil fuels, burning biodiesel, um, would be ways to use the energy once stored by plants. Okay, so the energy starts with the sun, it's produced by plants, and it moves up the food chain to other organisms. So plants use the sunlight to create their own food, and this makes them what we call autotrophs. All other organisms have to eat another organism to get energy. So the word for that is heterotrophs. So you have autotrophs, which are things that create the food from 
stuff that isn't food. Okay, so they have sunlight and they're going to go through this process and make it into food. Heterotrophs have to actually consume other organisms as food. And another way that we can classify these same ideas um, based on how they get their energy is to call them producers and consumers. So plants are called the primary producers because they produce the energy for the rest of the community. Again, they don't start with food. They start with sunlight and inorganic molecules, and they use that to create food. Anything that eats the plants is called a primary consumer. It doesn't make its own energy, it consumes it. And then anything that eats the primary consumers is called a secondary consumer. It wasn't the first organism to consume the energy, so it's secondary. And this can keep going until the third and fourth and fifth level consumers. There's different types of consumers. You may already be familiar with these words, herbivores, carnivores, scavengers. And we also want to talk about decomposers, um, which grow on organic matter and use the chemicals to break it down and get nutrition. So uh, fungus are decomposers and some bacteria are decomposers. So an example would be these mushrooms growing on a log. They're going to break down the wood that the log is made up of to get their nutrition. And detritivores are organisms that break down very small pieces of organic matter into even simpler forms. So earthworms, snails, shrimps, those are detritivores. And there is one type of primary producer that doesn't rely on the sun. So we mentioned this earlier. Um, there are some bacteria that use a process called chemosynthesis to take energy from chemicals and store that energy. They live near hot thermal vents deep in the ocean and use the inorganic chemicals around them to make molecules that store energy. So instead of sunlight, uh, their fuel is these inorganic chemicals. And they are the basis of their own food chain with primary consumers that eat them. So you can see in the picture the bacteria live inside of these tubes but then there's several other organisms that live in the area. Okay, The tubes themselves are other organisms. Um, so all of these are part of this ecosystem that's all fueled by the chemosynthesis. So in a food chain, you have one organism, this tree, for example, that's consumed by another, such as insects that eat trees. So the tree is a primary producer, and insects are the primary consumer. Then a snake eats the insect, making it a secondary consumer, and a fox eats the snake, making it a third-level consumer. But in real life, the communities, the feeding relationships are not this simple. So a food web shows all of the organisms in the community and what they eat. So there are actually five different organisms that consume the tree in this community, and three that consume the insects. And you can see that the fox doesn't just eat snakes, it also eats birds and squirrels. So a food web is much more complex than a food chain, and it shows a more realistic depiction of the relationships in the community. Okay, so let's do some review questions from this section. Okay, so here's our first poll for this section. Plants are what? Are they autotrophs? Are they primary producers? Are they both or are they neither? Okay, so we do need answers chosen before we can move on.
Okay, thank you to those of you that voted. Um, so here's what we have. Plants are both autotrophs and primary producers. So remember, autotrophs just means they're making food that has never been uh, food before. It came right from the sunlight. And they're primary producers because of the same thing. They are the ones making the food and they're producing it for the whole community. All right, and one more poll for this section. Uh, wait, let me bring the poll up. There we go. So if a rabbit eats grass and a hawk eats the rabbit, the hawk is what? A primary consumer, a secondary consumer, a primary producer, or a secondary producer? And if you've just joined us since the last set of polls, what we're doing now is just some review questions. You can answer even if you're not sure if you're right. It's just to kind of keep everyone participating, keep your brains working, and, and um, you know, let me make sure that not the majority of people are getting the wrong answer. All right, so thank you for your answers. And let's see what's correct. Okay, so the rabbit eats the grass and then the hawk eats the rabbit. That makes the hawk a secondary consumer. So why? The grass was a producer. The rabbit was the first thing that ate it, so it's the primary consumer. And the hawk is the secondary consumer. Okay, so um, also worth pointing out that this answer was one I made up. Secondary producer isn't a thing. There's really only one producer in any food web or food chain. And it's going to be your primary producers. Okay, um, but that's okay. These questions don't count for anything. They're just review. But good idea to go over them, make sure you know the right answers, because you may be seeing similar things on your test. So now that we understand what producers and consumers are, we're just going to look at um, the flow of the energy through the ecosystem and um, some some numbers involved with that. So the amount of energy stored in the plant is the total energy available in the plant. And then when another organism meets the plant, a lot of that energy is used or wasted, not stored. So this rabbit is using most of the energy that it gets from the plant in order to live and move. And that energy then just kind of gets released as heat off of the rabbit's body. A little bit of that energy is stored in its body. So when a secondary consumer eats the rabbit, a lot of that energy gets used up too. Same thing. It takes energy from the rabbit, but most of it's being used for the fox to live. And then some of it gets stored in the animal's body. So what's happening is, as you go up a food chain, less and less of the original energy is available to the next level. So the plant used a lot of the energy to grow and build leaves and flowers. The rabbit got what energy it could from the plant, but then it used up most of that. Okay, the rabbit's using the energy to grow and move around. And um, that means that it's only storing a little bit of it in its body, and then the fox is only able to get whatever the rabbit stored in its body. So in fact, only about 10% of the energy gets passed on to the next level. So um, we show this in what we call a pyramid of energy. So this is kind of the focus of section three in your book, is these different ecological pyramids. So in a pyramid of energy, the width of each level shows how much energy is still in it. So the primary producers have 100% of the energy, because that's our starting point. But um, as those are consumed by the next the level, the, the primary consumers, only 10% of that energy gets passed to the primary consumer. And the primary consumer uses most of that energy to live, and only 1% of it gets stored in its body and then effectively passed on to the secondary consumer. 
Okay, and then if we have another level, um, only 10% of that is going to actually be passed on to the third level consumer. So this is shown in percentages. Um, and what you're seeing, I'm saying 10% each time, and what you're seeing on here is, is the percentage of the original. So we started with 100% and only 10% got passed on. So 10% of the original is left. And then when 10% of that get passed on, that means only 1% is left from what we started with. And then 10% of that gets passed on, so only 0.1% is left of what we started with. Okay, so if you have grass and then you have uh, rabbits that eat the grass and you have snakes that eat the rabbits and you have hawks that eat the snakes, the hawk is only ever going to get 0.1% of the original energy that was stored in the grass. So because so little energy is transferred from one level to the next, it means that consumers have to eat a lot of whatever is on the level below them. So going from the top down, each level has to be supported by a level that has a lot more food than it does. So this is sometimes shown as a pyramid of numbers. The number of producers is usually more than the number of primary consumers, which is more than the number of secondary consumers. So we think about this image, the number of blades of grass and different individual flowering plants is more than the number of rabbits and mice and bugs, but um, there's more rabbits and mice and bugs than snakes that eat them, okay, and it can't can't be the other way. You can't have more snakes than rabbits and mice and bugs because if you did, they wouldn't ever be able to get enough energy because only 10% of the energy that is in the rabbits and mice and bugs gets passed to the snakes. And same thing going up another level. There's going to be a lot less hawks than there are things that hawks eat. Okay, so it's showing several snakes and only one hawk. So a pyramid of numbers usually looks like this. Um, but a pyramid of numbers does not always look exactly as expected because sometimes the numbers of the animals can kind of be deceiving. Um, so think about these two examples. An anteater has to eat thousands of insects in one meal, and a pack of gray wolves can all share one bison. So therefore, a pyramid of numbers can sometimes get a little wonky. It might be more useful to look at a pyramid of biomass. So biomass is the mass of the bodies of living things. Biomass then is related to the amount of energy available at a certain level. Therefore, the amount of biomass present in each level decreases drastically as you go up the levels. Okay, so um, this is similar to the pyramid we looked at before. You're going to have grass on the bottom, and instead of counting the individual blades of grass, um, we're, we're going by the mass. So the weight of all of the grass, in the let's say our ecosystem is a field, so all of the grass in the entire field um, is, is actually going to be really heavy. Um, then you've got the weight of the grasshoppers that eat them, so it's much less. So it takes this much grass to support this much weight of grasshoppers. And then the grasshoppers um, are eaten by mice. And there's the weight of the mice. I keep saying weight, but it's technically mass. Okay, there's the mass of the mice that eat the grasshoppers. And then even less is the mass of the snakes. So um, if you think back to something like the anteater, where a pyramid of numbers would be weird because one anteater has to eat thousands of, of insects, um, instead of counting the individual numbers of the insects, you just add it up and find the mass, the total mass of the insects. And if you think about the wolves eating the bison, instead of counting, well, there were six wolves eating one bison, that would be a weird pyramid of numbers. Instead, it's the mass. Okay, how much mass did the bison have? That thing is pretty huge. Um, and then what is the combined mass of all the wolves? So the idea is that the biomass of any level is limited by the amount of biomass in the level below it. Okay, so this pyramid is almost never going to be 
inverted in any way or, or messed up. It's always going to have the biggest numbers on the bottom and then smaller and smaller and even smaller because you need a lot more energy. This is all relating back to energy. You need a lot more energy on a lower level because only 10% of that energy is able to go up a level to support the one above it. All right, um, so this is kind of a, a tough concept, so let's just do two more review questions to go over that. Okay, so first question, um, true or false, energy flows in equal amounts from producers to consumers and then down from consumers to producers. Okay, so are those equal or not? Okay, so our vote looks like it got split 50-50, and that's okay. Um, so our question was, true or false, um, the energy goes in equal ways from producers to consumers, and then from producer, uh, consumers to producers. Okay, so that is definitely false. The energy only goes one way. Look at all these arrows on your, on your pyramids, only go up. So the producers make the energy, consumers eat it, the other consumers above them eat them, then it goes up. It never goes the other way. Okay, so the lower consumers are giving energy. They they can't take energy. They're being eaten. And then the next one is about the numbers. Okay, so there are 80,000 megajoules, which is just a unit of energy, so 80,000 units of energy available at the primary consumer level. How much energy is available at the secondary consumer level? Okay, so this one's a little bit tricky. We've got to go up two levels. All right, so there it is. You can vote. We're starting with 80,000. And it's going up from primary producer to primary consumer. And it's going up from primary consumer to secondary consumer. How much energy is available? And if you don't know, I can maybe help you narrow it down. It's not going to be more energy, okay, because you've got producers eaten by consumers who are losing a lot of energy. They're eaten by the next level. They're losing a lot of energy. So it's going to be something less than 80,000. Okay, so those of you that voted, uh, I think we did a good job. So we start with, oh, there's our answer, 80,000. Um, so we start with 80,000 at this level, the primary consumer level. Okay, first level consumer. How much energy is available at the secondary consumer level? So let's think about it. Um, if it went down by 10%, we started with 800,000 at primary producer. And now we're at this consumer, which is 80,000. So we need 10% of it at the next level. So 10% of that is going to be 8,000. And it didn't ask us about it, but at the third level, then we'd have 800. Then we're just going to decrease the energy by 10% every time. All right. Um, and then this one's not a poll because the answers are too long to fit into the polls. Sorry. Uh, but let's just think about it. Which of the following is wrong? A pyramid of numbers shows the number of individual organisms at each trophic level. Or B, a biomass pyramid shows the biomass on higher levels 
that is needed to support the biomass on lower levels. Or C, a pyramid of energy, shows the amount of energy available at each trophic level. Okay, so they all sound like they're on the right track. Okay, pyramid of numbers shows the number of organisms, biomass shows biomass, pyramid of energy shows the amount of energy. So the only thing that's wrong is going to be in this one. A biomass pyramid shows the biomass on higher levels that supports lower levels. That doesn't work. Okay, think about it. In, in a pyramid, you don't have this stuff on the top supporting what's on the bottom. It's, it's vice versa. Um, so it shows the biomass on lower levels that's needed to support the higher levels. In our last section in this chapter, uh, 3.4, which is biogeochemical cycles. So, yeah, so let's kind of break down that word because it's a big term. It's made of smaller parts. So bio means biology, so living things are involved. Geo means geography, so land is involved. And chemicals means that there's chemical and physical processes involved. The word cycle means that the materials are never really used up. They just continually go through different forms and can eventually be used again. These cycles also include human activity, since humans use resources in ways that aren't used in nature, but they aren't actually removed from the cycle. So let's look at these. The simplest one is the water cycle. Water from the atmosphere becomes stored in the oceans or lakes or groundwater, and it may be used by living things. And then it evaporates and returns to the atmosphere. So notice that water can evaporate after the living things use it or right from the oceans and lakes. So they all have these keys showing what the different colors mean. So biological, they could go from the groundwater through living things and then get evaporated. Okay, as animals breathe out or plants transpire, they'll just go back up to the atmosphere. Or it could just skip that and go right from the groundwater into the ocean and evaporate right out from the ocean. So you'll see in all these cycles there are several different paths that the matter can take. Oh, sorry. So the next one is the carbon cycle. So this looks a little more complex. Um, carbon is taken from the atmosphere and returned to the atmosphere. So even though there's a lot going on here, that's a basic idea. It comes from the atmosphere, it does something and then it's returned to the atmosphere. Okay, so biological things, you've got trees using it up, you've got it dissolved in the ocean, animals give it back. But you'll notice that um, it's mostly circles, but the orange line here for human activity, notice that it puts the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and there's nothing that humans really do to take it out of the atmosphere. So we put it into the atmosphere and then we have to rely on these other cycles to take it out. Okay, so humans just kind of shift it one way. We're putting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Next one is the phosphorus cycle. So um, this is mostly about taking it from and returning it to both the land and the ocean. Okay, so it just cycles around mostly and you'll notice that again humans cause a big shift. So normally phosphorus would only slowly be released from rocks as the rocks broke down, but humans mine it and then actually just dump it into the environment as fertilizer. So nitrogen and phosphorus are parts of um, fertilizer and we just add a lot of extra phosphorus to the environment that doesn't get taken up very quickly. So another big shift from humans in these cycles. And then the last one is the nitrogen, oops, sorry. Um, there we go. And the last one is the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen cycle relies on bacteria. The majority of the atmosphere is made up of nitrogen, but it's not in a form that most living things can use. But there's certain bacteria that can make compounds from the nitrogen that plants can use. Okay, so you see the bacteria shown 
as part of the biological part of this cycle. It comes from the atmosphere into the bacteria and then can be used by all the other living things. There we go, that's what the bacteria do, change nitrogen into a form that can be used by living organisms. And then this section talks about nutrient limitation. Nutrient limitation is the idea that an ecosystem needs all of the essential nutrients to thrive, and whichever one there is the least of will set a limit. It limits the primary productivity of the ecosystem. So here's an example. Uh, plants get plenty of carbon dioxide, um, which gives them carbon. You have plenty of other nutrients from other sources, but the soil only has a certain amount of phosphorus. The amount of phosphorus in the soil sets a limit for the number of plants that can grow in that soil at one time. So plants will just keep growing, um, new plants filling in all the spaces, until all the phosphorus is used up. So this image here shows a potato plant that's growing without enough phosphorus and it's making it turn purple. So if you try to grow more plants in the same soil, they might not even grow at all because there's just not enough phosphorus there for them. So in this case, phosphorus has set the limit for how much primary productivity can happen in that ecosystem. Okay, we're going to end with one more poll that goes over um, this important part of this section. So, uh, last poll, true or false, biogeochemical cycles pass elements through the ecosystem without destroying them so that they are used again. Okay, we need some participation here before we can move on. It's just true or false. Think about uh, what it's called, a biogeochemical cycle. So if it's a cycle, that means the materials have to just go through over and over again. Okay, so thank you for your answer. So that's what we ended up with. Um, that is true. The biogeochemical cycles pass elements through the ecosystem without destroying them so they can be used again. So sometimes we have shifts in these cycles where uh, they're going to get changed into different forms, where they're released into different places, but they're still part of the cycle and it may take a long time, but they can be used again. So that's all we have for now. I'm going to hang around if you want to ask any questions. Just type them in the question area. If you do have any more questions that you want to ask later or if you're watching this recording later and you want to ask questions, um, here's the two best ways to get in contact with an instructor.